As we can see in this diagram, there is central insertion of the umbilical cord. Now, if this umbilical cord is inserted on the margins of the placenta, as we can see in this diagram, in the margins of the placenta, then it is called a battle door placenta and it derives its name from the game like badminton which uses a racket and this insertion of the placenta makes it resemble to that racket. So, battle door placenta. Now, in this, the shortest distance between the cord insertion and the placental edge is less than 2 cm. And the incidence of battle door placenta is more in cases of twin pregnancies where it is somewhere around 24 to 33 percent and in single term pregnancies the incidence is 7 to 9 percent. Now in most of the cases this battle door placentas are asymptomatic. Now in most of the cases this battle door placenta are asymptomatic but they may result into IUGR, preterm labor, decreased birth weight and if the placenta is low lying then during delivery this marginal cord insertion may be compressed leading to fetal distress. Now let us talk about the next type of placental abnormality and that is extra corial placenta. What is it? Normally the chorionic plate that is the fetal side of the placenta and the basal plate that is the maternal side of the placenta both are equal in surface area. But if the fetal side is smaller than the maternal side, then it is called extra corial placenta. And how do you remember it? The basal plate is bigger, B, B. Now, as the fetal side is smaller, so it is surrounded on all the sides by the maternal side of the placenta. And this surrounding can be of two types and according to this, the extra corial placenta is also of two types. It can be circummarginate placenta in which the surrounding of the maternal side around the fetal side is very smooth. As you can see in this diagram, the transition between the maternal side of the placenta and the fetal side of the placenta is very smooth and so it is called circummarginate placenta. We will understand this again by this diagram. This is a normal placenta where the maternal side and the fetal side they are equal in surface area whereas in circummarginate placenta the maternal side is bigger or the fetal side is smaller but the transition between the maternal side and the fetal side is very smooth and it is circummarginate placenta. Now if this transition is not very smooth and there is a fold of fetal membranes forming a thickening, valve-like thickening all around the fetal side, it is called circumvallate placenta. Valve-like thickening in circumvallate placenta. And the same thing we can see here in this diagram. The maternal side is surrounding the fetal side and there is fold of the membranes around it, which forms a valve-like thickening. The next important point is that in circumvallate placenta, the fetal side is slightly depressed as compared to the maternal side. And if you see in ultrasound, this fold of membrane appears as thick linear band or a shelf-like structure. And this type of placenta leads to increased risk of abortion, APH, IUGRs, preterm labor, retained placenta and increased watery vaginal discharge which is also called hydoria gravidarum. Now moving on to the next type of placental abnormality, it is placenta succincturiata and in this a small part of the placenta is separated from the rest of the placenta and a leash of vessels connects the mass to the small lobe as we can see in this diagram. Here we have the small lobe separated from the main mass of the placenta and both are being connected by leash of vessels. Now similar to this placenta succincturiata, we have another type of placental abnormality which is called placenta spuria. In this also a small part of placenta is separated from the rest of the placenta but the difference is that there are no communicating blood vessels. As we can see in this diagram, this being a normal placenta, 
This is placenta spuria where a small lobe of the placenta is separate from the main mass and there are no connecting vessels. And it is assumed that this accessory lobe is developed from the activated villi on the chorionic levy. Usually the chorionic levy, it is a smooth part lying adjacent to the decidua capsularis. But a part of placenta if it is formed from the chorionic levy, it leads into this type of placental abnormality, placenta spuria or placenta succincturiata. Now the next type of placental abnormality is also similar to this which is called placenta bilobata and in this the separated lobe and the main lobe they are of equal size and connected by blood vessels like placenta succincturiata. This type of placental abnormality is also called placenta bipartite or placenta duplex. As we can see in this diagram, now this being the normal placenta, this is placenta bilobata where both the lobes are equal in size and they are connected by a leash of blood vessels. Here also you can see this. Now these type of placental abnormalities, they are usually diagnosed post delivery. If the entire placenta comes out, so by examination you can easily know that this is placenta bilobata or placenta succincturiata or placenta sporia. But what happens in most of the cases that the accessory lobe might be left behind in the uterus and this might lead to primary or secondary PPH. Primary PPH that is if just after the delivery this lobe of the placenta is left behind it will lead to gush of blood and when we do the uterine exploration we are able to find this extra lobe of the placenta. If this retained placental lobe remains as such after delivery it might lead to secondary PPH later on or it might lead to uterine sepsis or polyp formation. Now the next type of abnormality that we are going to talk of is fenestrated placenta and in this a central part of the placenta is missing as you can see in this diagram the central part is missing and this defect usually involves the villus tissue within the chorionic plate. Now the next type of placental abnormality that we are going to talk of is a rare placental disorder called placenta membranacea and in this the placenta develops from both the chorionic frondosum as well as the chorionic levy and because of this the placenta becomes unduly large and thin and is characterized by the presence of fetal membranes covered by the chorionic villi. Now what do we mean by this? Normally the fetal part of the placenta develops from the chorion frondosum which is towards the decidua basalis and the chorion levy which is towards the decidua capsularis it becomes smooth but if the placenta develops from this side also then it is called placenta membranacea and this results in the placenta being unduly large. You can see there is a large placenta and it will become very thin and it is characterized by the presence of fetal membranes covered by the chorionic villi. The fetal membranes that is the chorion will be covered by the chorionic villi as we can see in this diagram. This is the large placenta. Now in this placenta membranacea, the characteristic clinical manifestation is recurrent painless vaginal bleeding during pregnancy. Recurrent painless vaginal bleeding. And since this placenta is very large, there might be encroachment of the some parts of this placenta into the lower segment resulting into placenta previa. And as we have told that there are recurrent painless vaginal bleeding, so which is called APH. The next complication that it may result into is that due to imperfect separation of the placenta, it might lead to PPH. There are increased risks of chorioamnionitis, fetal growth restrictions, preterm birth and even stillbirths might result.